Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Let's talk about a serverless monolith. If you're scratching your head thinking, well, that makes no sense, then follow along so I can clear up what I think is one of the biggest misconceptions and why a serverless monolith is a valid strategy. So let's start off what I think is typical for people to think of a monolith for a web app or an HTTP API. We have our client make an HTTP request, and this could be hitting a load balancer or an API gateway, but let's say a load balancer, and that load balancer is then making a request to our instance, to our app. If we're in AWS, this could be EC2, it could be that simple as, a, uh, as that VM there, or maybe we're using something like ECS and we have a container. Either way, we have our instance of our monolithic web app or HTTP API that's serving that request. And typically, because we're behind that load balancer, that allows us to scale out so we can have just multiple instances, either in EC2 or containers, that are handling those requests. I'd like to thank Current for sponsoring this video. Current's an event-native data platform that feeds real-time business-critical data with historical context and fine-grained streams. From origination to destination, enhancing business analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Current, check out the link in the description. Now on the flip side, when we're talking about serverless, most people are thinking the complete opposite of a monolith. They're more thinking about microservices or small independent deployable functions that do specific things. They're not thinking about a giant executable, they're thinking about something very specific that needs to execute. So what that looks like is when we have our client make our HTTP request and we're hitting our load balancer or API gateway, what it's doing is it's converting that actually separately into an event that is invoked in, for example, AWS Lambda or Azure Functions, whatever. And that's what's actually executing our function and then converting that, returning the results to HTTP on the way out. If you have different rules that, so you can execute different functions. So we'd have another request based on a rule at our API gateway or load balancer says, okay, for this particular route, we wanna call this separate function because it does something completely different. The reality of it is, this is kind of the misconception is that these all need to be different code bases or deployed separately. The reality of it is they do not. They can be the same thing of a monolithic code base that's deployed as a single Azure function or AWS Lambda, et cetera, because this is all about execution. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I think plagues our industry is this idea of a one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, meaning that we have some logical boundary, some piece of functionality, that's one, that gets represented in source code exactly of what that functionality is, and then we take that source code and deploy it exactly how it is, meaning a one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. That's not how it needs to be. To illustrate this a little bit better of what I'm talking about, here's the WebQ worker pattern. We have our client make our HTTP request to our HTTP API. It's doing stuff with our database. Then what it's doing, it could be placing a message on a queue, or maybe we're using event-driven architecture, placing an event on a topic, regardless. Then what we have separately is a worker. This worker could be another process. It could be a thread within our main process. And what it's doing is it's picking up those messages on the queue so it can perform that work, interact with our database, send emails, whatever the case may be. It's doing work asynchronously. The key thing about this is that HTTP API and the worker can be a monolith, meaning they're a monolithic code base. They're the same code base. They're built from the exact same source code. The difference between them is just the entry point. We have one entry point that's interacting with HTTP. We have another entry point that's dealing with our queue or message broker, et cetera. It's still a monolith. They could be deployed as separate processes or the same process, like I said, with different threads, but it's still a monolith. Even if we had these deployed in different ECS containers or whatever, however you wanna deploy this, how you deploy it, it still doesn't decide that this is still a monolith. Now, what I often read in here in this negative light is people think about a monolith as being this, because it's a monolithic code base around tight coupling. They think the tight coupling is creating this rat's nest and it's kind of this derogatory idea of like a monolith is just a big turd pile. But you can create a turd pile many different ways. Our monolith here, let's say we have all these different modules and we have all this coupling between it, that's what makes it the turd pile is all this coupling. But if we distribute this, we get rid of it in process, now everything's separate, now we're interacting over the network and decide to call these services, you have still the same degree of coupling, if not worse, because you've introduced the network. This all of a sudden isn't any better because you have network hops and service A is written in a different language than service B. 
Again, arguably this is much more difficult to manage as a lot of people I know in my comments have posted. So that tight coupling isn't what's defining a monolith. Just like you can create a tightly coupled monolith, like a tightly coupled microservices, you can create a loosely coupled monolith just as you can with services. It's about how you're making that communication, how you're loose coupling, etc. So when we're talking about a serverless monolith, it's totally doable. We can create a loosely coupled monolith, hide that behind our API gateway or our load balancer, our HTTP request comes in, it's converting that to event, it's invoking essentially a fat function. That's our monolith. We don't have to have all these different deployed functions that are defined by different routes. Everything can go into the same entry point and execute that function, that Lambda. And there's a lot of tooling that supports this. My example here is I'm using the template for AWS Lambda using ASP.NET Core minimal APIs. And it really describes what this is doing. So it has a separate ASP.NET Core server that's basically doing the translation from your API gateway or your load balancer to ASP.NET Core and then back out the other way for the responses. And really, it's really a simple line here. If you're familiar with ASP.NET Core, this is the one really doing all the magic. That's really doing all those conversions. And it's just not minimal APIs. Even the example here, they have MVC controllers that you can use as well. So tooling supports this. You can have a Lambda, essentially a fat function that supports multiple different requests, your singular monolithic code base. Serverless is really just defining your execution model. It's the physical deployment aspect of your system. That's really what it's defining. It's not defining, are you using microservices or are you using a monolith? That's really where this all this misconception stems from. Now, whether you should use serverless and that, whether that fits your needs is a different story. I often find a lot of the conversation around serverless is about scaling, specifically on scaling up. Let's say here's our load distribution. It's typical nine to five situation here where this is our average load given a particular day. What people are often thinking about for scale with serverless is, well, what happens if this happens? Where all of a sudden I have this bigger spike and I wanna be able to handle that. Well, that's really not the way to be, I generally think about it because you can have different ways for auto scaling in containers, et cetera, to kind of manage this based off of metrics. What to me is more important with serverless is not scaling up, it's scaling down specifically if you need to, to zero. That means that you don't have a lot of traffic or requests or workload where you just wanna have your execution, pay for your execution, and that's it. You don't wanna have resources doing absolutely nothing that you're paying for. So this is typical when you have sporadic load or when you have things that are more recurring, where you have gaps in between, where there's nothing that needs to happen. So oftentimes when I'm thinking about serverless, it's not about scaling up, it's about scaling down. So is a serverless monolith an oxymoron? No, it actually exists, it is a thing. Whether you should use it or not, it's dependent on whether serverless makes sense for you. Does making, creating a monolith and have a monolithic code base make sense to you? Coupling does not determine whether you have a monolith or not, or whether you have microservices. How your deployment model, your execution model, does not determine what your architecture is. What your, defines your architecture are the architectural styles and patterns that you're using. That all combination of all those things that you're using, that's ultimately what defines your architecture, your system's architecture. If we can get beyond this, well, it's specifically all this one to one to one and thinking of it always this way or how all these people come up with, well, if you have tight coupling, then it's a monolith. No, it's not. Clearly you can have tight coupling with microservices or a kind of a service driven environment. You can have a loosely coupled monolith. We gotta get out of this mode of kind of defining a singular thing and that you gotta fit in that. It's a combination of things. The architectural styles, how you're coupled, the communication mechanisms, that's what's defining your architecture. And of course, get in the comments and let me know if you're using a serverless monolith and why it makes sense to you, or if you're thinking about it, or just generally about what architectural styles and patterns are you using that are defining your architecture. Get in the comments. And of course, if you wanna get a little bit more interactive, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other software developers about topics like this around software architecture and design. Links in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.